We all want to be loved. We all want to know that there's someone in this world that knows us inside out and yet still fully accepts us. You know, many of us, we, we've grown so accustomed to presenting a part of ourselves that is at least tolerable socially. You know, sometimes if you are really yourself, it can be abrasive to some people. Like some people may not necessarily like you in your fullest, most true self. So many of us, we have a social side, and many of us, we have a private side. And in the private side, my imagination can run wild. I'm sure we might even look like someone totally different than most people know of us in the public side. But there's a social, there's a human reason why that happens. It's because usually people can accept aspects of our personality, aspects of the way that we think that don't rub against them the wrong way. And so we like that for the sake of acceptance, for the sake of not ruffling feathers, for the sake of being at least someone that people can smile with and people can actually have a relationship with. We present one aspect of ourselves because we just don't know what it is in our natural experience to have someone just accept us every single aspect of us unconditionally. You know, this is why I think people are very suspect of God. And people are very suspect of faith. And that is why many times we try to poke holes in the Bible because there is something about the unconditional love of God that we just find so difficult to fully accept. Sometimes we try to add some things to it, like God will love me unconditionally as long as I am doing everything he told me to do. Or God will love me unconditionally as long as I am giving something to his church. Or God will love me unconditionally as long as I cut something out of my life that I know is a vice that he doesn't like. Somehow, some way, we kind of think to ourselves, to get the love of God, we have to do what we do with everyone else. Present a side of ourselves, a part of ourselves that we think he can see and tolerate so that he can love us. But I want to be very clear on this. God is not like man. God is not like man. There is something, as you read through the scriptures, there is something about the way God thinks about you and I, which is absolutely unique in our experience. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. And I want to present it as something you've never experienced before. It is quite possible that as a Christian, someone who has trusted in Christ as your Savior, you still haven't experienced it. It's because we kind of have to relearn love if we're going to understand the way that God loves us. And so, hopefully, in just these few moments, we will see God's love in a different light. Let's pray. Father, in these few moments, help us. Help us to get rid of this notion that we have to impress you for you to love us. Help us to get rid of this notion that religiosity now triggers love from God. That does, that's just not the way it works. In fact, you've said in your word that you love those who hate you. Father, help us to understand unconditional love and help us to respond correctly 
to unconditional love. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message is based on one of my most favorite praise and worship songs. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Now, when we sing hymns, we sing doctrine. You know, people who wrote the hymns back in the early 1900s or in the 1800s, those people thought of church in one way. We are going to use music to communicate fundamental doctrine, to communicate ideas about God that people can, you know, get into their minds through repetition. That's why hymns are so powerful. Hymns communicate doctrine, hopefully. Some of them, not so much. But most hymns communicate doctrine, solid knowledge about God. Praise and worship songs, spiritual songs, are a bit different. And if you don't really like spiritual songs, the reason is because we're not necessarily used to communicating the way we feel about God to God. How do I really feel about God? Most spiritual songs are a response to our experience with God. So sometimes when you're singing a song emotionally about God and you haven't had that experience with God, it's hard to sing it. <laughs> it's hard to mean it. So we would sing a song like the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, and we look at the words and be like, well, I don't know if I know this. I don't know if I've experienced this. I don't know if I'm able to sing this with conviction. It's not the words. It's the experience. And in the spiritual, in singing spiritual songs, you are basically saying, I have been engaged in relationship with God. I know what he's done in my life. And I just want to express the emotions that I feel about the way he lives with me, the way he is with me. I want to challenge you. Don't close the door on spiritual hymns. And I'm talking to a lot of people who are like, I don't like them praise and worship stuff. Don't close your mind to it. It is an important aspect of the way in which we worship God. We don't just regurgitate doctrine to him. We tell him how we feel. And we tell him how we feel because we know that it is safe to do so. Some of us don't feel like it's safe to do that. We, some of us don't feel like it's safe to tell God our feelings because we're not so sure about his feelings for us. We doubt it. We wonder about it. But let's just clear that up this morning. The reason why I can sing any emotion in my heart to God is because I am dealing with a God who loves me in the truest sense unconditionally. If you ever read the Psalms, you will hear sometimes in the Psalms, the Psalm is saying, I love you, God, and I'm expressing feelings of love towards you. And then you'll hear sometimes in the Psalms, God, I don't understand what you're doing. God, I am confused. God, why are you allowing the wicked to overwhelm me? God, you see the contrast in emotions in the Psalms because a song is not just dependent on the fact that you're feeling good. You can sing a song even in your darkest moments. Why? Because it is safe to do so with a God that loves you unconditionally. When you have unconditional love, you can express yourself to God in any way without any feeling of backlash or any feeling of rejection. Why? Because God knows you and loves you anyway. You know, sometimes we try to do to God what we do with other people. We dress up and we say the churchy thing to God in the same way that we would with our brothers and sisters here on earth. You know, like God doesn't know the truth. <laughs> Like God doesn't know really how we feel. And then we wonder 
Why are we not growing spiritually or why religiosity doesn't equate to spirituality? It is because when it comes to God and me, all God has ever wanted from me is to feel secure enough to be honest. To be honest about my faults. To be honest about my strengths. To be able to say, you know what? In spite of the fact that I have great virtues, I have some vices too. I have some struggles too. I fail too. And that's okay. Because he's not going to use those vices against you. In the, on the contrary, my friend, he wants to use those vices to help you to understand unconditional love. Unconditional love is being able to say, this is my good, this is my bad, this is my ugly. Do you still accept me? And God will say to you every time, I will always accept you. That's the love I'm talking about today. It's not a love where you have to cover up or trick God. I mean, who can trick God? You can. None of us can. It is a love that's true. It's a love that's honest, and it's a love that's safe. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I want to use the lyrics of that spiritual song, and I want to also use the words in Romans chapter 8 to talk about what God's unconditional love looks like. The first thing I want to talk about, about God's love, is this. Unconditional love from God is proven by the fact that God loved you and me even before we were born. Let me say that again. Unconditional love from God is proven by the fact that God loves you and me and loved us from eternity past and he will always love us that's the key to understanding what unconditional love is all about. You see, unconditional love is not about what you do. Unconditional love is about a choice that God has made about you. <laughs> he made that choice knowing everything about your life. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows everything you would do right. He knows all the things you would do wrong and yet made a choice for you even before you were conceived in your mother's womb. That is proof that God doesn't love us like we love each other. God loves us in a different way. He loves us not based on what we do. He loves us based on a choice that he made concerning us. The Bible says, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I wasn't around when Christ walked this earth. In fact, that was thousands of years ago. I wasn't around to know and understand even the significance of what he was doing at the time. Who knows? If I was around at that time, I may have been part of the throng saying, crucify him, crucify him. Because we're very good at eliminating that which is true for the sake of that which is religious. <laughs> and many of us probably would be in that throng saying, crucify him, crucify him. But you see, even in that moment, you see the unconditional love of God through the words of Jesus saying on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Did they ask for forgiveness? No. Did they deserve forgiveness? No. But unconditional love sees to the care of even those who are enemies of God. Why? Because of a choice that God has made in his heart towards us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's proof of unconditional love. The song that I mentioned earlier, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. 
The first verse of that song says, Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. You see, you can't understand how those lyrics affect your heart until you understand that God loved you before you were born. That God sacrificed his life in anticipation of your birth. Thousands of years ago, at a different time, in a different place, he did that to prove to you that when you set foot into this world, you are already loved. Now, there are many people who are born into families where, let's just say, love is a challenge. Love is difficult. Love is painful. And unfortunately, sometimes conditional love hurts because you're saying you're dealing with imperfect people in an imperfect world. And sometimes, unfortunately, even in the sake, for the sake of love, there is a lot to be desired. There's a lot of pain. And so many of us, we take the context of our upbringing and we try and apply it to God instead of erasing the slate of this idea of love and allowing God to show us what true love is. The Bible says love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So even in our attempts as human beings to love, sometimes we fall short. But remember this, God is not like us. So where we fall short, God never fails. And so in understanding unconditional love, know this. You already have proof of God's unconditional love for you in the reality that Jesus Christ died for you. If nobody else in this world loves you, you can put your hat on the idea, the truth that God loves you. Not because of what he says, but because of what he's done. He proved it. By sacrificing his son. The Bible says very clearly in Romans chapter 8 verse 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He, listen, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? My friend, the love of God persists in your life and mine through the reality that he gave his best for us. Some of you have children. How many of you would be ready to sacrifice your child for anybody in this room? You would much rather walk outside and never come back. Because our love again has a limitation, especially as it relates to the people and the things that we love, but that's not the way God works. Unconditional love gives up the best for the least, gives up the best for those undeserving. Unconditional love is proven when someone you love is sacrificed for someone who hates you. And God did that. For you and me, whether you accept it or not, his love stands the test of time. And his love is something you can observe for yourself. He's proven his love by his sacrifice. Take it or leave it. But that, my friends, is unconditional love. If you would hardly do that, with your loved one, how much more the master of the universe, the one who created all things, the one who doesn't need us. How great is his love that he would take that which is most precious to him and give it to his creation. My friends, that's love. Unconditional love. 
How many people have heard the story of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for their sins and laughed at it? And thought, oh, that's ridiculous. Why did God go through all of that? How else could he prove to you and I that we are loved unconditionally? He gave himself to show us a different kind of love. He loved us before we were born. The second thing we see in the same portion is this. Not only did his love precede even our birth, God's love takes away all accusation for our failures and faults. And I want to emphasize this one. Because as human beings, especially as religious human beings, we don't understand this one very well. God doesn't just forgive you because you do right things. God doesn't just forgive you because you're a good person. That's not the way that unconditional love works. You see, he's not over here saying, I'm going to love you, but you got to come over to where I'm at before I love you. No. God's love goes to where you are, wherever you are. <laughs> you know, the scripture says, if I ascend into heaven, God is there. If I make my bed in hell, God is there. You ever thought about that? Does the presence of God go to the uttermost parts of the earth where there is absolutely no righteousness for you? Absolutely he does. Absolutely he does. God goes wherever you go. And even if you are cursing him every step of the way, he is there loving you. The Bible says he allows the rain to fall both on the just and on the unjust. Why? Because not only Christians are worthy of rain. <laughs> Everyone whom he has set his love upon is worthy. Not because they deserve it but because he declares them deserving of it. The overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God takes away all accusation of failure, all shame, all guilt. He frees you up so that you don't have to walk around wondering if you are truly loved. You can actually live in the mercy and grace of God, yes, but live knowing that he will never, ever turn his back on you. And I've heard Christians say it all the time. Like you can actually do things to let God not forgive you or not God not love you. I, let me say fundamentally this goes against the very core of God's heart. But then people will say, well, but if you, if you say that, that means that you're giving license for people to go and sin. Let me tell you something. When you understand true love, when you understand unconditional love, it is its own motivation to want to please God. But you see, when you don't understand real love, you're going to use it as an excuse to go ahead and hurt God's heart. You see, unconditional love, it garners a true and sincere response of love too. When somebody really loves you, like from the heart, unconditionally, it does something in you that makes you want to love them too. Because you know who you are. You know you're not necessarily worthy of unconditional love. But when you receive it, there's something about it that says, okay, even though I'm not perfect, I have to show him love too. Because how in the world am I deserving of so great a gift? It takes away all charges. There's another verse in the song, that very same song. It says, when I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. But you have been so, so kind to me. 
You know, I remember the first time I heard this song. That was the point that broke me. Because I know and understand the guilt I feel when I fail. I know and understand that people sometimes when they see you fail, they might not necessarily forgive you for your failures. So you continue in shame even though you might receive the forgiveness of God. Let me say this. When it comes to God, there is no looking back. There is no, Andrew, do you remember when you did X or Y or Z? That's not how God works. God is not saying, hey, if you do X again, I'm going to take my love away from you. That is not the way God works. God loves me. Even before I ask for forgiveness for my wrong. I don't think you guys are hearing me. God loves me even before I ask for him to forgive me for something I've done wrong. He is chasing after me even in my wrong. That's love. You tell me God is going to abandon me for my wrong? And I'll tell you, you don't know the God I know. God loves unconditionally, even when people spurn that love. It doesn't change. It persists. It doesn't stop. That's why the chorus says, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, it chases me down. It fights till I'm found. It leaves the 99 for the one. That's what it does. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. You see, that's the power of spiritual songs. It takes the reality of what God does and it brings it personal. God, you do this for me? Wow. Wow. You've been so good to me. So kind to me. I don't earn it. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Wow. And it's supposed to challenge me to think differently about my faith. Stop thinking of God as ready to shame you or guilt you or make you feel bad about a failure. God knows you. God knows how bad you feel already. God wants you to know that all you have to do is just say, I'm sorry, and we'll keep going, and we'll keep walking, we'll keep serving. Why? Because he does not want you to walk around in chains. He wants you to be free in every respect. Only God and unconditional love can do that for you and me. There's no one in the world that behaves that way to us. Only God. Only God. It takes away the charges. The Bible says in Romans 8, 33 and 34, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is what? Interceding for us. So whenever we fail... Whenever we don't do what we were supposed to do, we are still not only loved by God, he speaks and advocates for us when we can't speak and advocate for ourselves. Jesus says, hey, you know what, Father? Andrew did it again. He messed up again. Yeah, we, know it. we knew it was going to happen. We knew from eternity past what was going to happen. But well, let's just remind ourselves, even though we don't need reminding. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at the piercing in my side. I have already paid for everything that Andrew will ever do wrong. So guess what? Let's just keep on loving Andrew. Let's just keep on loving him. <clears throat>
thirdly and finally, God's love, and this is one of the signs of unconditional love. God's love does not give up. It does not give up. There's a verse in this song which says, there is no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, <clears throat> coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There is nothing that can stop God from coming after me. That's unconditional love. There's nothing that I can do. There's nothing that Satan can do. There's nothing that anyone in my life can do that will ever make God walk away from me. That, my friends, only comes with understanding the depth of my iniquity, the depth of my failure. I've had relationships with people broken over my failures. I've had relationships that meant the world to me that I no longer have because of love that was broken by me. But let me say this. There is no such thing with God. I could break, destroy, every com break every command that he's given, do everything that he told me not to do, and he will still be coming after me. Do you understand the depth of God's love? Just in case you don't understand, let Paul tell you. Because he wrote it in one of the most magnificent portions of scripture, and we read it this morning. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Listen. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am certain, I am sure, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all God's people said amen. amen. He's not giving a comprehensive list here. He's just giving you all the things you need to know. Whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, whatever it might be, there is nothing in this world that will ever stop God from coming after you. Nothing. Nothing. People might stop coming after you, but God is not like man. Unconditional love doesn't care what you do or how far you go. He will come for you. He leaves the 99 sheep for the one that has gone astray. That's unconditional love. Because while he's away from the 99, maybe some things could happen, right? But his love for the one, his love for the one will push him to do that. That's unconditional love. I say that to say this. If you've never experienced the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, even if you claim to be a Christian, open up your heart today. You're not dealing with man. You are dealing with the Almighty who is able to love you when no one else can. You're dealing with the Almighty who is able to accept you as you are. Not the way you want to be, but as you are today. Virtues and faults. He will accept you. And he will never stop pursuing you. That's love. 
My prayer is that all of us would understand this, internalize this, and I guarantee you, once you begin to internalize the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, it will change your worship. It will change your worship. You won't be ashamed or afraid to talk about the way you feel about what he does. Spiritual songs won't just be for them, it will be for you. Spiritual songs won't just be for this time, it will be every day. Because every day we experience that love and grace. I trust that each and every one of us would be able to say before our life ends that we know what unconditional love is like because we received it from our creator. That's my prayer for you and for myself. Father in heaven, thank you for this word. Keep it close to our hearts and help us to remember you are not like man. You don't have a quota on forgiveness. You're not one where our, your love is dependent on what we do or say. You love us just because you choose to. You've chosen to. You proved it by dying on the cross for our sins. Help us to understand that love in a personal way and to love you back. As imperfect as we do, to love you back because that is the least that we can do in our response to your unconditional love. In Jesus' name, amen.